Um, so I showed this the other day. You know, uh, we, we, this is just uh, to go back and, and show that you know real rocks are pressure dependent, right? So if you go and you have you have no confining pressure, so the X indicates material failure. Material failure in the sense of I had one piece of rock, and now I have two or more, right? The material has failed, okay? It's, and if I have no confining pressure, you see the material goes up and it, and it fails, right? But if I have, in this case, uh, 23 and a half, you know, so this is for a Carrera marble. If I have 23 and a half MPA confining pressure, now the material goes up, it reaches a peak, and it begins to s soften. It loses strength, but it doesn't actually fail in the sense of, you know, it has no strength until it has quite a large strain. And if I increase the confining pressure, this so now this continues to go out, the material, even at 50 MPA, the material never fails. In other words, when you let it go, it's still intact. If you increase it, increase, increase, the material begins to harden. So it actually gets stronger as a function of pressure. Well, very very low confining pressure, right? If you have very low confining pressure, you can fracture it quite easily, right? But but yeah, I mean, at a, at a real so the 50 MPA is like a real in situ stress. You know. So yeah, I mean, you you don't fracture it at all, and it goes out to you know six percent, almost six percent, you know five percent strain. So it has quite a bit of what we'd call ductility, which people don't really think of rocks as ductile, right? in the sense that, um, do you guys know what I mean when I say ductile? Like a, like a paper clip is fairly ductile, right? You can, you can take a paper clip and you can bend it out, and you, you, when you do that, you plastically deform it, right? The, the paper clip, if you bend it far enough, the paper clip doesn't spring back, right? It, it, stays, it stays deformed. So you've plastically deformed it, okay? And ductility then is a measure of how much plastic deformation the paperclip can withstand until failure, right? And the paperclip you can essentially completely, completely unwind it into like a straight rod, right? So it's fairly ductile material. It does under confining pressure. It's it's probably uh, not as ductile as, as this material, but yeah, certainly. This is something you never see in the. Uh, it's a conveniently ignored in the petroleum literature, <laughs> because uh, the models in most of the you know in, nowadays most of the design is done in computational models, and the the computational models typically used in um, you know in, in Petroleum engineering just don't include that level of complexity. So uh, here's an example of some other failure criteria. So we can see the the more the more coulomb is is in here. Um, it's there. Um, there's some other ones. The, the circular one um, is called Drucker-Prager. So again, uh, what, what we're not seeing, you know, we're looking down the end of it, but what we're not seeing is that all of these have some, some sort of conic shape and uh, you know, some change in slope as it goes back towards the axis. Okay? So they're all, they're all getting smaller as we go back towards the axis. Okay? So the circular ones are called Drucker-Prager. Um, there, the, you know, the more Coulomb. There, there's also this modified wheel, wheels bowl, which is sort of in between. So it has, uh, it has some sort of curvature along this axis, right? But but also has the sharp corners like, like the uh, more Coulomb. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, how do you choose one over the other? And part of that answer is, um, you know, related to how well it fits the data, right? But in you know modern engineering mechanics, we're going to solve these with a computer, okay? 
And when we do things in a computer, we're, we're always doing things discreetly and incrementally, right? In other words, you know, the, the, the clock moves forward in time continuously, right? But in a computer, we move forward in time in discrete steps. So you know, we 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 take we we fix a value, take a step in time, and evaluate quantities, and then take a step in time in the discrete sense, right? Uh, likewise, if we're applying forces, right? This really depends on the boundary value problem you're solving. But if you're applying forces, you know, if if I push on this desk, in reality, I'm I'm applying this load in a you know, the harder I push, there's a continuous curve, right? But in a computer, I I can't, you know, I can't reproduce that continuous curve. I have to do it discreetly. So I increment the load. Right? I, I, apply, I, I, I take my you know, maximum force and I divide it up into increments. Right? And I increment the load and I, and I solve the problem. And I increment the load higher and I solve the problem. And I increment the load higher and I solve the problem. Right? So because in the computer we have to do things discreetly in steps, and remember what I said earlier several times. The state of stress is either inside this or it's on the surface. It's invalid to be outside. Right? So it's inside, in which case it's elastic, or it's on the surface, in which case it's fair. Right? Or yielded. Well, what happens in a computer program is because you're taking discrete steps, right? And so say you're, you know, whatever load path you're taking, I take a step and I find myself here, right? And I increase the load and I find myself here. And I increase the load, and I find myself here. And I increase the load, and I find myself here. Right? And then I get real close, and I increase the load, and all, I, all of a sudden, I find myself outside the yield surface. Right? And that, that's just because in the nature of the way I'm doing it, right? I'm, I, I take a discrete step, and I don't know what else to do except evaluate the stresses as if they're elastic. And then it's, not, it's, it's only when after I've evaluated them that I can determine Am I inside? If I'm inside the yield surface, okay, I, I'm really elastic. Let's keep going. But if I'm outside, I'm like, uh-oh, I'm I'm now I can't be out here. I'm, I've violated the model. Right? And so, what you have to do is you have to return yourself. Right? And the way you do that, and we're not going to go into all the details in this class. That would, if you're ever interested in, you know, if I ever teach advanced geomechanics, mechanics, the graduate course again, we do go into all the details. These are so-called return algorithms. So basically, what you do is you find yourself out here, and you solve a constrained optimization problem to get yourself back on the yield surface. And de depending on the complexity of the model, because again, as they're drawn here in, in, in the simplest form, these circles or hexagonal things are fixed, but they can actually be a func they can grow as a function of deformation. And in that case, you have to do it iteratively, right? So you, you, you evaluate the stress, but, but because you've deformed it, the yield surface has grown a little bit. So you have to back up, shrink it, you know, try again, and it's sort of an iterative procedure where eventually you converge on the state of stress being on the yield surface, but also where the yield surface is because it grew over that load step. All right. So all of that is to say, in a computer code, I mean, or you know, the the answer as an engineer isn't always just what fits the data best, right? Because in the way we actually solve these problems, you have to implement it in a computer. And in a computer code, you're always sacrificing speed for stability for accuracy. You can never have all three. There's no free lunch. You'll never have a model that's the most accurate, the fastest, and the most stable. Right? And so for an example of that, uh, let's consider, in the context of what I was talking about with the return algorithm, let's talk about one of these models, like the more Coulomb model, that has these sharp corners. Right? So the way the way we do these return algorithms um, typically is something called a normal return. So essentially, if we find ourselves outside the yield surface, we construct a normal vector from the hydrostat, and then we return ourselves to the yield surface in a direction that's normal to that vector till we get back on the yield surface. Right? But what happens now? Uh, what happens, you know, what, what is my normal vector if, if the state of stress is exactly such that the normal vector is like that? What's the normal vector to that sharp, you know, I'm talking about normal vector, I'm talking about normal vector to, this, to the surface, to the yield surface, which is easy to construct if it's a circle, right? It's always defined. 
What's the normal vector at a point? It's undefined, right? So I have to do something else, okay? I mean, we have ways to sort of fix it, right? But we sacrifice the stability, right? So in other words, the, these, these round circular models, the Drucker-Prager type models, are very stable. We have well, really good, robust algorithms to return ourselves to the yield service and other, and other things. Um, so you have to ask yourself, is the precision I need, in other words, is, is the, does that circle not fit the data well enough? Or am I really out here in these regions of loading and I, and I must use the more, or, you know, the more Coulomb model so that I can capture this material behavior precisely. And is that worth giving up the stability that I would have in the Drucker-Prager type algorithm? So again, these are, this is just a high level conversation. In a class like my advanced geomechanics class, we, we actually go in and code these return algorithms up and all this, right? So again, as engineers, it's not the, you know, the right model to choose. Uh, depends on the problem. And, and the complexity of the boundary value problem. And if you're solving it on a computer, which you almost always are nowadays, you have extra considerations with respect to stability, speed versus accuracy.